I became homeless and I had my son prematurely. Today, we have Rakea Canem on the podcast. She's got the most incredible story of tenacity. I was on benefits. I did live in a council home and those were stepping stones to where I am today. It was the most challenging time. I did not have a job for 18 months. I was like, well, what can I do? If I can't find a job, I need to start a business. I'm sitting in Nando's, minding my own business, looking at my phone, and all I can see is the Instagram following going up, up, up. I'm a person who has fought for my entire life. And if you're coming for my designs and my business, which I worked so hard for, I take it seriously. Visibility is absolutely key for me. I like being clear on what I'm spending my money on every single day. Revolut's budgeting and analytics gives you instant notifications and budget alerts whenever you spend. The app breaks it down for you really nicely. So you can see if you're overspending on too much homeware, for example. My biggest budgeting hack is that I segment my salary as soon as it comes in. It makes budgeting for the month so much easier. Sorry, freestyle. Also, using Revolut Saving Vaults, you can earn up to 3% annual interest paid into your account daily. One of my nifty saving tricks is using Revolut Spare Change Roundups, where they round up your card purchases to the nearest whole number so that they can save the rest in your vault. For example, if you spent £3.60 on a coffee, Revolut would round that up to £4 and put 40p in your chosen vault. Download Revolut for free and create an account now. <laughs> I'm really excited about it. <laughs> what is up, guys, and welcome back to the podcast. I never really know how to introduce that, but that's all you're getting today. Today, we have Rakea Canem on the podcast, and she is someone I've wanted to get on the podcast for a while. She is someone that I personally really like to follow on Instagram in particular as a, just like a founder doing their thing. She's always really educational about what she's doing and her journey. And I've always just really enjoyed following her because she is just very much a strong woman. She says what she means and she's really happy sharing her journey, which I feel like is rare to genuinely see that you're seeing behind the scenes, not just like behind the scenes, like behind the scenes of the photo shoot, but genuinely like what the struggles are, what the challenges are at every point and like how to rectify them and how she's kind of like dealing with that. So for me, I've always really, 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 really enjoyed Rakea's content. But on top of that, not only has she done absolutely incredibly well and she has built such an amazing brand that I genuinely believe when like when you go on the Instagram, you see the art direction, you see how it all looks. It's a brand that appears huge because of how well it's kind of tied together. And I feel, and like how amazing it looks. And behind the scenes of that, Rakea has had just like the most unbelievable story, which she talks about her background in this episode and talks about kind of where she's come from and, you know, the challenges she's faced. And I don't think that they are ones that you'd expect at all from the least kind of, I think just in all of our preconceptions that we have, like whenever we click on someone's page or we see someone's position now, to see that she was a teen mum who had to drop out of school, who spent 18 months unemployed way after that, after she'd got a law degree and all of these different things. To me, she's got the most incredible story of tenacity and she just has not stop. She's not let anything stop her. She's not let anything get in her way. She's genuinely tackled every issue head on and really created her luck and her kind of future that is now. And I can't wait to see where Canem's goes um, and I can't wait to follow their journey. And there is genuinely no one more deserving than Rakea. So can't wait to see it happen. I hope you really enjoy this episode. I think you really will. It's the most unbelievable story. As always, if you do enjoy the episode, um, please do like, subscribe, rate. I don't know literally what platform you're on, but whatever platform you are on, please make sure to leave some sort of rating because it helps it hugely and make sure to follow the podcast as well. And as always, I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> I'm literally so excited about this episode. As soon as Rakea walked in, I was literally like, I am so excited for this episode. <laughs> I feel like every time I, well, first of all, you're one of the only people who I watch their Insta stories every day. Oh. And I don't mean you, for you to take that. <laughs> like, it, it, it's definitely a compliment to my side because I literally like don't click a lot through. Yeah. Um, and I find them educational I find them fun I find them like you just show so much behind the scenes and I feel like you're such a great person to follow for anyone who you know has started a business works in fashion in general you know strong women is my shit 
And Thank you. You provide that right back so at well. you. <laughs> um, so I want to go straight into it and kind of go from the very beginning. I find it's always really helpful for guests to generally give us like a little bit of background about who you are and kind of how you were to, you got to where you are now. Could you take us back to the very beginning mm-hmm. and just tell the story about your your childhood, where you're from, what kind of <laughs> what your childhood was like, and we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, sure. Um, so I grew up in Brooklyn. Um, people know it as Bangla Town. So it's in Tower Hamlets and predominantly a uh, Bangladeshi community. And I am one of seven siblings. And my parents are Bangladeshi immigrants and they came to uh, London in the late 70s. And they were garment workers. So they used to work with local factories based in Brooklyn. So yeah, my childhood was pretty much I'm a middle child as well by the mm. way so I <laughs> maybe that's why we're so similar <laughs> yeah. but yeah I guess growing up I don't know I was just a bit of a quiet kid mm. just focused on my education wanting to be something yeah and so you were one of seven siblings what did your parents see as success like when you were going to school and when they were you know generally they were kind of talking about your grades or whatever or kind of talking about what you would end up like being what was what was their kind of view of success in that way I feel like my parents never pressured myself or my siblings to kind of become successful because they hadn't really had any experience of that they weren't the kind of parents that will you know the typical Asian parents that would push you to become a doctor or a lawyer or anything like that they weren't like that I think they just saw with myself at school I was getting good grades and my dad would really encourage it Mm. but yeah I think it wasn't any kind of pressure it was just be great Mm. you know and so what type of thing did you enjoy at school I loved art I loved art I was really good at art and English literature I was really good at but yeah 100% I think like art was my thing and everyone knew I should have known then that my creative skills were going to become something but I didn't recognize that back then I mean anyone have a look at your feed and they will see the art is there the creativity (laughs) is there like you have such good content I could only dream and so when you were a teenager you were obviously going to school you were loving art you were loving English language was there anything that kind of stood out to you as like what your next steps would be like when you were doing GCSEs kind of all around then what did you kind of think the future held for you and how did that kind of go from there I didn't have a clear vision Because as I said, I'm a middle child and my older siblings, they didn't go to college. They didn't go to university. So I didn't have a kind of like understanding of what the educational path should be for myself. I probably when I was 16, I think I wanted to be an air hostess. I didn't know what I wanted to do. When I left school, I went to college and I studied fashion design for just six months. Mm -hmm. And then I dropped out because... I was having a baby. And then after I had 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 my son, I decided to completely change Mm. my view on what was important or was defined as success for myself. So I changed my entire, you know, want. And I decided to study English, law and politics at college and then law at university. Because that's when I just thought I've had a child very young and I come from an Asian community and I've kind of you know, gone against the expectations my parents had of me potentially succeeding in whatever that may have been. I just thought studying fashion as a teen mum, no one would kind of validate that as success. So I thought, let me just do what everyone else does, study law, maybe become a lawyer. And, you know, when I graduated university, 100% my my family was so proud. Mm. And it kind of like balanced out and kind of negated the whole teen mum thing because I was trying to prove yes I've had a child young but I can still do everything other people hope for me to do and at that point obviously you say that it had I guess what had happened and you you having a child at kind of that age do you feel like your biggest motivation then was kind of rectifying your I guess image in your parents eyes and other people's eyes 100% I just I think I felt some shame you know, because I left the community completely and I saw some of my peers, people that I went to school uh, with, they went to university. And even though I was behind because um, I, I 
I decided to get back into education when my son was about one years old. I just thought this is something I have to do because I want to prove to people. I don't want to fall into the stigma of a typical teen mum, especially as an ethnic minority. I just thought I have to do something about it and I have to kind of like fight against that stigma or not become another statistic. You know, teen mum on benefits or in council housing. Not that there's anything wrong with that because that was me. I was on benefits. I did live in a council home and those were stepping stones to where I am today. So at that time, when you kind of, I guess, found out you were pregnant and decided, was that decision to leave school, was that was that a pretty clear one? I can imagine it was very, very hard at the time. I can imagine going through that at that age um, would have been very stressful in many, many ways. <laughs> I don't think that even comes close to covering it. What was your kind of headspace at that time? So I became homeless. And whilst I was homeless and moving hospital to hospital, um, I had my son prematurely. And I think it was like an awakening in my mind, like all of this, all of these things are happening. I'm living in hostels. What is this life? This is not a life I want for myself. myself. It's not a life I want for my son. How do I change that? You know, and that has to come from me and I have to go back and study, get an education. And then whatever happens from there will happen. But when when my son was born prematurely and he's in hospital for like three months in the neonatal unit, it's like everything changes when you have a child. And I just thought to myself, I have to be a good role model for him as well, because I don't want him to see me as someone that's not fighting for my life. Because I would want my son to do that for himself, you know? Mm, yeah, I think that's so powerful. And I mean, I think you've more than proved to absolutely <laughs> everyone, not that you ever had anything to prove, but like, I can imagine that your son looks at you now oh, and does, yeah. is, you know, completely in awe of yeah. what you've done <laughs> and what you continue to do. Did you always know that you were going to go back to education after that point? Yeah, I just, as I said, it was like an awakening, some like a light bulb moment. I just thought to myself, there is no way. Mm. Imagine I'm sitting in a hostel and the conditions are horrible, horrible. I, it, it, it feels so far from reali- reality, you know, me sitting here today. And I just thought to myself, there's, I, you know, I need to get back into education and I need to change my life. I need to become something. I need to become successful. Not that any, as you said, like I didn't need to prove anything to anyone. It came from within me. And I just thought that change comes from myself and I'm the one who needs to action it and do Mm. something about it. And how did you manage going to college and also having a son? I can imagine that wasn't easy at all. It wasn't easy at all, but I'm so lucky because I really took advantage of back then there was connections I don't know if it's still around and connections was for kids from like 14 to 19 years old and I was 18 at the time so I went there and I was asking them I want to get back into education what can I do there was a scheme called care to learn and they provided funding for young teen mums to get back into education so I took advantage of that by you know, finding the best childminder. When I was in college, um, he was probably like one years old and I wanted, I didn't want him to be in a nursery. I wanted him to be taken care of like very closely. So he was with the childminder and then he would be with them from like eight o'clock till the end of the day and I'll pick him up. But he was such a good baby. He was so, so good. I feel like not to get spiritual, but I feel like God blessed me with a good baby because he knew the situation that I was in. If that makes he he would never cry. He mm-hmm. He was... Perfect. And from the point that you went back to education, did you, did it ever feel like you wanted, like it was too much? Like you maybe like wanted to, like you felt like you couldn't do it? Or was it something where you knew so clearly from the way that you, from the time that you went back because of that kind of light bulb moment that like, no matter what you were going to see it through? Because I can't imagine it was easy at all. There was never one moment. I am such a stubborn person. When I have a goal in mind, I'm going to get it done regardless like no obstacle in my way can stop me Mm. nothing can stop me and I didn't find it as a challenge I just had the end goal in mind and I just thought this is what needs to be done so yeah (laughs) and so you spent the next few years at college you were studying three subjects and then you decided to go to university to study law at this point how had your I guess ambitions changed like what did what did you want for yourself at this point how were you managing being a mother after I finished college I decided I wanted to become a lawyer because it seemed quite an attractive profession to get into and I recognize myself as someone who's quite tenacious and strong and strong-willed I just thought 
that would be the best route to take. And I loved studying the case law. It's something that I enjoyed. So that's where my ambition to become a lawyer came from. And I just enjoyed it. So I thought that was what my career was going to look like. But it didn't. And and so when you came out of university, you started, did you start working in law straight after that? Did you start at a solicitor firm or? No, no, everything changed again. And this is what I, I think like a lot of people think that you have to have your life figured out at every single stage, mm. but you don't. A lot of people don't have it figured out. As I said, when I was 16, I thought I was going to be an air hostess. Then I thought I was going to study fashion design. Then I decided I was going to become a lawyer. And then as soon as I finished uni, I just thought I can't afford to do a legal practice course. I don't have the funds for it. There's no way I could do it. And I decided I wasn't going to do that. And I you know, I need to support my son. So I decided to get into work and kind of make a living to support us. And I just fell into various roles, nine to five in various industries. So the whole law ambition just went out the window. And so what were those types of roles? I mainly worked in HR. I think what what was quite interesting was I found studying whilst being a mum easier than working whilst being a mum. Because at that point, you know, I have to... I've got a fixed time, Monday to Friday, nine to five. And my my son was still young and I don't have any, I didn't have any support at the time. So just kind of balancing parenting with trying to support my son was a bit of a challenge. And did you find it harder to be, to, I guess, be a parent at that point? Like when he was slightly older? Yeah, I think so. Because I think he had a lot more needs mm. His personality is growing, his character's growing. I found it really hard to juggle working as well as like tending to his needs as well as a lone parent. It wasn't the easiest. And so tell me about those jobs that you had kind of right after law. You know, how did that lead to the point that you started Canams? As I said, like I, I've worked in several different industries or companies, mainly within HR. What happened was I got made redundant from one of my jobs and this was at a startup company, which was great experience because now I've got a startup and I know how it works. <laughs> like, oh, I know this one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so I was made redundant and then I just couldn't find another job. And it was crazy. And it was the most challenging time. I did not have a job for 18 months. 18 months and I'm telling you I'm not the kind of person that just sits and wallows and is not going to figure out a solution in how right. to find a job I went I treated looking for a job like a job itself I used to go to um you know the Hoxton and sit there with my laptop Monday to Friday nine to five looking for jobs job applications rejection after rejection constantly and I'd go to interviews and they'd just say oh you know the typical um, you're too overqualified. You'd find this job boring or X, Y, Z and all you're of You're like, this. take me. I was like, I will do anything. <laughs> it even got to a point I was almost evicted from my flat because I couldn't pay my yeah. rent. Yeah, because I used up my savings from all my previous jobs to survive. And yeah, I, it was just, it was really difficult. And it just got to the point where I was like, well, what can I do? If I can't find a job, I need to like maybe start a business or a side hustle I always had something in mind and I always loved fashion and I saw kind of like a gap in the market for affordable luxury wear and then I decided I'm just going to do a business plan I went on Google downloaded virgin startup business plan template filled it in did all my research and then I decided okay I'm, I'm going to do that but I'm still going to look for a job and then craziest thing happened I'm in the internet cafe downloading my business plan and then how did this even happen? I had five job offers <laughs> that same morning. I'm printing off my business plan. I'm like, yes, I'm going to become a businesswoman. All of this is going to happen. And then suddenly five job offers. So then what I decided to do was I decided to take the job that paid the most. Because <laughs> again, survival. Of course. Survival. And I decided... I'm still going to try to set up a business because I've learned I can't stop. I can't fully rely. I think I had trust some issues. So trust <laughs> issues. I, I had imagine. some sort of trauma just thinking, oh my God, I could get, I could lose another job and what's going to happen then? I need some sort of additional financial security. So then that's when I decided, you know, I'm going to do my further research. I'm going to try to find manufacturers or suppliers and just figure it out. And that's how 
cannabis came about. I, I don't want to lie and say I always wanted to be a designer, right. and you know it's been my passion. No, I needed money. That's how Canum started. Yeah, and it, I mean it also goes to show that like there's so many different motivations for starting a business, and just because you did it because you needed money does not take away at all from yeah. the fact that it is an incredible business and beautiful designs and all of that. And I feel like it's such a it's such an incredible story. And I can imagine at this point having obviously had when you were a teenager having realized that you were going to be a mother so young and then having pulled together all your strength to like bring it together find support go back to college then go to study law then realizing you can't uh, you can't afford to do the lpc then going from there into hr jobs and then being in this situation i can imagine it was probably like for you to have the strength to like so many people would at this point have been like well <laughs> Fuck that. <laughs> like, as in, and you just, you like really, really kept on going. Like the tenacity again that you had. I mean, you don't need me to tell you this, but to be able to do that all back to back, I can imagine at this point when you were 18 months, like without a job and you're applying every day, you must have, it must have felt like wading through it was like. so exhausting and it was so demotivating because then I had family or friends saying, have you not found a job yet? Have you not found a job yet? And it's like, guys, I'm trying. You did everything. Right I did as everything. Well. And it's just, it just got to a point where I even had to kind of seclude myself from being around people because I went into a point of kind of depression because I'm just like, why am I not finding a job? Like, what is it me? Am I the problem? Like it, it just, it was really exhausting. And I just thought no one's going to help me. I've never, ever in my life ever sought any kind of financial assistance from anyone. And I've always thought to myself, I became a teen mom. That was my choice in my life. My situation as a lone parent is my choice. It's my life, but I have to do something about it. If that makes sense. Like, mm. you know, it doesn't matter what happens or whatever obstacles I was facing. And it was like this change, that change, not having a job for 18 months at the end of the day, that's my problem. And I need to fix it. And I need to do something about it myself. And that's exactly what I did. Yeah. I mean, we can, we can see, <laughs> but no, a hundred percent. I mean, it's, it's incredible, like how many obstacles you've been through and been able to like really come out on top. And I think it's one of those things where like, if anyone came across your social media now, how much yeah. of that would they be? I mean, you share a lot of it, yeah. but like, if they just see your feed, they no. see your life, like how much of that you, however many years ago, when you were sitting in that internet cafe, like having applied for jobs for 18 months, having gone through all of these different things that really tried to hamper your success and looking at that feed, you'd be like, no way. Yeah. No way. A hundred percent. And I still have people sometimes making assumptions about me or how I got to where mm. I am. And that's why I feel like I need to be authentic with people because I know there's so many people out there who are like myself that might be an ethnic minority coming from a working class family who had nothing that they might be a teen. They might have been a teen mom as well. They don't know how they can progress their life or how they can come out of their challenges. And I feel like I owe something to people to let them know because I never had that. Mm -hmm. When I was when I was 17 years old and I became a mom, I never had an actual role model to look at who had been through everything I had been through. And now when I'm honest about it on my social media, I have so many people saying, thank you. Like, because it's a niche problem. Right. <laughs> it's a niche problem. And there's not many people that have had that. So I just think I yeah. need to be honest. And I think that's amazing as well, because I think it could be really easy for you to sit in this position now and also be like I just want to be grounded in where I am now I've come so far I don't need to constantly revisit my past it takes a very strong person to also be like sure maybe I don't want to be revisiting my past all the time and of course you don't you, like you have no obligation to at all but the amount of people you must help every time you talk about it and every time you kind of share your experience is I, like colossal I can't imagine how many people must just be like even if it's not the same specific situation like hearing either even these small bits of whether it's about the job hunt whether it's about doing a degree and then realizing it's not for you whether it's about being a teen mom like whatever it might be there is so many things that you've overcome that other people I'm sure are yeah. in that moment and I'm sure you in that moment as well were like there's I, I'm never going to be the view I see of success yeah. and for you to share that and be comfortable with kind of revisiting that constantly to be able to be like you can do it too. Like it's here, yeah. it's completely your choice. Like all of that, I feel like is really, really powerful. I want to talk about the beginning of Canons. 
I want to talk about the conceptualization, the concept behind it. I have to say, going into affordable luxury fashion is a big ask for someone being like, what do I do as a quick buck? And then yeah. you being like, I'll go for a more affordable version of the thing that people already sell for thousands <laughs> because it's so hard to make and so difficult to get the right quality and so difficult to get the right designs. And I'll just do that. What was the, and I agree, it's a gap in the market. And I agree, you guys do it incredibly, but it's definitely not an easy feat. Mm. What was your kind of reasoning behind making that? So I saw a collaboration with Bauman and H&M back in... I remember that. 2000, was it 2015? I think yeah, it was. Something like that. And I, I love embellished pieces. And growing up as a South Asian Bangladeshi woman, we used to wear silk kameezes or lengas and they're very like intricate. And I always wanted to modernize that. And I wanted to combine my love for western pieces with my love for my eastern heritage and i just wanted to kind of do something with that and then i saw the collaboration with h&m and barman and they were doing the jackets that were very intricately embellished and i saw that people were reselling it on ebay for thousands of pounds right. and it was crazy and i saw the success that h&m had had with that specific jacket and i thought this is something that i could be doing because when me and my sisters are buying or designing sewer camises we know someone it, there's a place called green street in east london and it's full of like south asian wear and i thought i'll just pop into one of these shops and then just ask them if they can help me make one of these jackets uh, they were like, <laughs> no, because um, I showed them a design and then they said to me, yeah, 900 pounds. And I was like, no, yeah. if that cost price is 900 pounds, how much am I going to sell it for? That's not affordable <laughs> at all. The math is, yeah, is not, not math. <laughs> exactly. So, um, yeah, I think like Canon's just started from me seeing the kind of gap and what I wanted for myself. I'm a person who loves luxury statement styles, something that's very unique. And I wanted to find something for women like myself who appreciate those statement pieces as well. Mm, yeah, I promise you, the, the more money I earn, the more canons I buy. <laughs> because like every time I scroll through your website and even over the past like year and a half or so, the um, how far you've come in terms of like the breadth of designs and like the different, yeah. you know, what different types of things you can get on the site for like whatever the occasion might be. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, it's quite clear that I'm the biggest fan girl. <laughs> um, rightly so, I think. Um, so at that point when you'd gone to the shop and you'd kind of been like, Will you make this? And they're like 900 pounds. How did you go from there? Because I can imagine that was a bit of a setback. Honestly, it was such a challenge because at that point I already had my nine to five mm. and I get the Your violin. new nine to five that you didn't want to lose. My new nine to five that I didn't want to lose. So I went after work and, you know, get the violins out. It was rain. It set the scene. It was raining, torrential rain. And I'm walking down Green Street, going to every single shop, showing them my designs. And they're just giving me a crazy cost price. And I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? Like, maybe I can't do this business. And then I was sitting on the back, back of the bus and I just thought, let me just Google manufacturers, maybe in India and go directly to the source itself rather than going through a third party. And then I found, you know, I listed down 20 potential manufacturers, emailed them all, sent them my design. Only two got back to me. One was super keen. I sent them the design. They told me it would be ready in like eight weeks. Sent them the money for the first sample. Um, How much did that first sample cost? Do you remember? It was probably like 180 pounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I just thought, okay, let's do this. And then I went to my parents' house and I was saying to my brother, oh, I'm going to start a business because he's always like very much interested in business. And he just said to me, you do know that they've run away with your money and you're not, you're never going to see that sample ever again. <laughs> but I did. A week later, I received I can't imagine how much your heart would have sunk. I was like, oh my God. After all that, I've worked so Someone get Rikaya a business. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So then I received the first samples and I was so pleased. I, I, I was so, so pleased. I was so happy with it. Um, And then I decided to do like a DIY. I, I, I didn't have the funds. Mm. I used up my salary from my nine to five job to get to pay for my sample, to do a DIY photo shoot, to get a photographer, pulled in some favors, wrote on social media. Does anyone fancy like um, doing a photo shoot? I scratch your back, you scratch mine kind of thing. And then that's how we did the first photo shoot. Amazing. Yeah. I would love to see photos. When you look I do at photos have of that photo bad. shoot. They're not yeah. bad. Yeah. I mean, my ones at the beginning. Fucking <laughs> yeah. hell. 
I cannot relate on there, not bad. Um, so, th- I mean, that's just amazing. And I feel like what's so interesting is that starting a business is obviously so confusing. And from the outside, you kind of look at businesses now and you're like, how the fuck did they get to that yeah. point? And I feel like it's so easy to look at that and be like, well, I could never do that because I've never worked in fashion or I could ne- I've never like worked with suppliers or I've never worked in buying or like whatever it might be. Yeah. And the fact that you went on and you literally Googled and you emailed some people and just like took a bit of a leap. And like, I understand it's not, you know, it, I'm so glad that that one did actually yeah, make you your too. sample and everything. <laughs> but generally, you know, it's an industry out there because it's an industry that works. And it just goes to show like how much just being like, if I don't fucking try, yeah. then I'm never going to know whether yeah. it's going to work. And for you to like email that many people, put it forward, get the design done. Even the fact that you did a design yeah. based on the fact that like you weren't working in fashion. Yeah. Like you didn't know how to like do a design. Did you do like a tech pack or anything? No, I didn't do any Just a drawing. That. Just the drawing on a piece of paper with a pencil, like so <laughs> basic, so basic. But luckily the manufacturer, she totally understood my yeah. vision and she just killed it amazing and so that how did that first launch go you know as i said like everything was pretty much diy it was the plan was it's just super small it was nothing i think like a lot of people when they visualize starting off a brand like they imagine it huge like everything has to be big yeah but for me it wasn't like that i just thought this is just a small side hustle this is what i'm gonna do so what i had done was um we had like a small instagram and i already for my personal Instagram, I built relationships with influencers and I messaged a few directly and I just said to them, oh, you know, I've got this jacket and I think you'd love it. And so many of them were so nice. And one in particular, Charlotte Emily Sanders, she's the first, she's the OG. Really? She is, yeah, she's the first person. And she was so nice. She just said to me, oh, just put it in a, just put it in a cab and then I'll just wear it. I'll take a mirror selfie and I'll give it back to you. I was like, that is so nice. There were such nice people out there. So nice. And then she wore it. She took the mirror selfie and it was the day that I was launching. I'm sitting in Nando's, minding my own business, <laughs> looking at my phone. And all I can see is the Instagram following going up, up, up. And I'm having loads of other influencers contacting us saying, oh, would you like to collab? Would you like to collab? And it that's how it started. That's crazy. Yeah. And again, and like, I know that you present that when you're like, oh, I can't believe this happened, all of this. Like, you really do create your own luck because even the fact that you were like ballsy enough to just be like, I'm actually going to message all of these influencers who like, you know, I follow or for whatever reason, I'm yeah. going to message these factories. I'm going to literally like, nothing was getting in your way. No. You were literally just like, <laughs> okay, next step. Like, talk exactly. to influencers. Like, so many people... I feel like naivety is actually one of the biggest strengths when it comes to like starting a business in that way as well, because it's kind of like you never stop to think like, oh, well, maybe they're going to want payment or maybe yeah. they'll re- like they'll reject it or they'll never reply and like all of this like that's the stuff that you just have to absolutely get rid of when oh, you're 100%. doing starting a business because it's like okay but you need to try yeah like, you need to try and it might not work and people will tell you oh no that's impossible like influencers would never do this or a factory will yeah. never do this or whatever and you just being like oh. yeah <laughs> and i had faith in my product as well because mm. i just thought I know these influencers like, and I know their style. I know what they post on their feed. And I know that the product is aligned to what their sense of style is. So mm. I knew like, yeah, hundred percent I was ballsy because I knew this product is amazing. And I know you're going to want to wear it because influencers like wearing something other people aren't wearing. 100%. So I was like, yeah, let's do this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so what was the next steps after that? I can imagine. How many orders do you, do you remember how many you got at that point? It's so funny because when I did my business plan, I literally put if I just sell five only five jackets per month that would give me a bit of money on the side and like Mm. I'm I'm happy with that that's fine I got way more orders than that and I was just thought oh my god and I had to go and sit down with my brother who's a finance director and sit down with him and say to him what am I going to do like I'm I'm getting all these sales like what do I actually do had you bought any stock was it no nothing everything was made to order and everything is still made to order because I just thought to myself it doesn't make sense like let me test the product let me see as much as I had faith in it so let, smart let me see if it's gonna work and people are gonna like it and then they did and I continued the whole made to order model that's amazing cash flow wise that's yeah. really great yeah um and so when what did you kind of do next at that point like you've had one like product that's already got off to a success you've got people starting to follow you like what was next I booked a flight to India brilliant <laughs> 
<laughs> it, what only you would do. Yeah, because <laughs> I had to visit the manufacturers. Yeah. I wanted to see what were the conditions, how do they work, what is the process. I want to know everything. I want to meet the team. Like these are the people that help that have helped me succeed, and I want to meet you and I want to build a relationship with you. So that's what happened. Went to India um, using I, your work holiday. I pulled a sickie. No. <laughs> <laughs> anyone listening no she didn't Sorry. <laughs> oh my god amazing that's yeah. so funny yeah so i i i booked uh booked booked a sickie <laughs> booked a sickie um yeah for one week and i just went to india and it was an amazing trip i loved it and then i ended up going up before covid i probably went to india like four times four times every year right. just to see them wow. like to see uh oversee the collections and the production and did you find that really sped up the process when you were there yeah 100 percent. i my I, we still work with the same manufacturers even though our supply chain has like yeah. um expanded um that's amazing from yeah. that first email yeah oh my we god still work. that's yeah. amazing yeah she's amazing she's so sweet every, every single time i've gone to india she's always trying to feed me like but um yeah our relationship is great she requires very little from me she just understands my vision and what i want um and we still work this way mm, yeah. that's incredible and so how did you decide what you were going to release next did you just keep releasing the same one for a while when did you start yeah. to like branch out from that point that one specific jacket was doing so good so then I developed it into like a bomber jacket and then eventually dresses everything was embellished 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 every single for every single collection nothing was really plain styles and then what I noticed as I'm running this business was seasonalities matter during the summer periods it was so quiet and during party season, it was so busy. Right. So I was trying to think like, okay, if summer is quiet, what kind of product can I release for summer to keep the momentum going? Then I introduced more dresses and like plain styles. And then, yeah. Yeah. So that's been not recent, but like relatively recent yeah. over the past like year and a half. Is yeah. that right in saying? So end of 2021 after COVID, because COVID was of, of course like a difficult time where I'm a party where occasion wear brand and there's no more parties and no one's going out. So no one's buying mm -hmm. these kind of intricately embellished. Wearing their embellished No, no one's buying it. Exactly. No one's buying it. So I had to think like, what can I do? I need to keep it going. So, um, you know, around 2021, I decided to create like, because we were moving into um, party season. And I thought, okay, I want to expand the product range to collect more demand. Um, and then that's when I introduced the plain style dresses with like uh, little bits of embellishment, whether on the back or like across the border. And it just went crazy. I, we were not ready for it. And were you scared before that point that the not doing embellished styles would feel like a kind of departure from your brand? I did. I did. I felt like I had like a strong niche. But as I'm running the business and recognizing that this doesn't work every single season, what can I do to make it work every season? Mm. Um, and it was just more of like, Again, an, a survival thing more than anything. And did you have to find new suppliers to make the new pieces with new materials? Yeah, we started working with a manufacturer in London. Oh, amazing. Yeah, and yeah, we will, we source everything locally because it's made to order. Everything's local, locally sourced. We produce in, you know, London, somewhere in Tottenham and yeah. <laughs> Incredible. That's absolutely amazing. And from that, I think it's so interesting that like a lot of these points you've said like, it's survival, it's survival, it's survival. And it's so interesting because I feel like a lot of your big moves in terms of like what you've done, like starting the company, like even like new designs, like all of this has been it's almost like you've been pushed out of your comfort zone. Yeah. And then you very quickly made decisions being like, okay life is pushing me out of my comfort zone like this is how yeah. I'm gonna deal with it and I think it goes to show like the importance of like react like listening to what the world is telling you yeah like listening to being like okay it's telling me to move more in this way and you've managed to evolve every single stage of your life and your business like with that in mind yeah yeah which I think is like really really powerful and it so back in 2019, I, a little birdie told me that you sued another company for copying your designs. Yeah. How did that come about? So I, on my personal page and on Canons, have got a very loyal following. And people always tell us when they see something that is... Yeah, I relate. Very, very the amount I get in my DMs every day, I'm like... Mm. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we had someone contact us and then I messaged the brand directly and I said to them, hi, you're infringing my designs. This is an original um, artwork, craftsmanship, X, Y, Z. You know, please, can you remove this from your marketing and sell on your website? The usual, we do this all the time. And people usually just respond and they take it off. On this occasion, they didn't. This person did not take me seriously. And as I said, I feel so sorry for anyone that tries <laughs> me because they don't know me. I'm a person who has fought for my entire life. And if you're coming for my designs and my business, which I worked so hard for, no. I I'm have not, time. I have time. <laughs> I have time. She didn't take me seriously. And I was so polite to her. And I said to her, I'm, I'm being honest with you. Like this is because she was saying to me, it's not a copy. It is like for like, it right. was one of the jackets. And with the ja jackets, they are very unique. The artwork that you see. Yeah, on them, even like the beading design, the beading, like all of this. The embellishment placement, that is artwork that I've created. Mm. So it's not a coincidence that it's the yeah, same, right. you know? So I told her this, she was denying it. She didn't take me seriously. And then um, we sent them a letter of claim through my solicitors, she again wasn't taking it seriously. You're like, I studied law, please. Exactly. So and then she had like, she changed her email signature to like legal rep legal team for the brand and we could see right through it. Eventually she did take it seriously. We did sue them. We did win. We collected lots of damages. It was very awkward and it was so painful because... This person had gifted a lot of the jackets to influencers, which some influencers I've worked with as well. And what she had to do as part of our deed of undertakings was get those influencers to delete their posts and remove it. Like how that's, that's so, so awkward. Yeah. Awkward. Along with so many other um, damages and claims and, you know, mm. requests that we had to. And how did you feel when that kind of like first popped up? Like when you first started seeing people copy your designs? I mean, it is a compliment and it's fine. And I kind of like pick and choose my battles. Sometimes I can see it's not an exact copy and it's not. Yeah, and it's also fine. like the whole of fashion operates off a yeah. base of an inspiration. Like when you would have created your original mood exactly. boards, you know, Balmain, like whatever yeah. it might be, like there's always going to be things in there. There's a very big difference though between like uh, in activewear, for example, IP is almost impossible because yeah. it's like, how much can you do to a legging? Like, yeah. are you going to put a fucking zip all the way up yeah, the side? Exactly. Or like pearls on it? Like, probably exactly. not. So like within certain areas, obviously there's going to be a lot of replication or similar inspiration. And like, I look at it the majority of the time and if it's not a fashion piece, it's kind of like, it's a legging. Like, yeah. as in like, they're going to, you know, like, of course, I'm sure that came from, you know, similarity or their promo video will be exactly the same or whatever. Yeah. But it's also like, fine. You are in a very specific area in which I can imagine that it's, I know how frustrating it is for me when I'm yeah. like, oh, I know that, I know where this has come from. But I can imagine for you when it's A, something you fought for so heavily in your life yeah. and kind of been like, no, I made this happen. Yeah. Especially if it's like a cheaper more fast fashion company yeah. I can imagine that's like oh uh, yeah definitely it's just so exhausting and it's sad because I'm not a horrible person and I don't want to be suing anyone I don't want your money I don't want you to have to destroy your stock or you know be contacting influencers to take down posts and remove all of that I know how hard it is to set up a business but right. it's just such a shame where I know some people can just throw around the whole, I'm going to proceed with legal action. Some people do that. I don't. I take it seriously. You know, I'm a woman of my word. And I just, let's just play nice. Just, just cooperate with me. Mm. And again, like that didn't happen on that occasion. But, you know, as I said, we won. And so one thing I'm really grateful for, um, for the other brand is she contacted me via email six months later and she apologized to me very mm. sincerely. And I love that because I just yeah. thought, you know, I wish you the very best of luck with your business. Now you've learned a lesson and it was a lesson for myself as well. Yeah, and like it takes a big person of you to be able to recognize as well that like actually I can imagine that, not that it was right, but I can imagine that time was really hard for her as well and that she probably thought, I'm going to start up a business. I'm seeing yeah. this one do really well. Hey, I can do that too. Yeah. Like I see that fashion, you know, is all based off like replication and trends and like all of this. So I'm and gone way too close to the bone and like yeah. flown way too close too to the sun. But for her in that moment as well, like I'm sure it was like, I can do this too. And like that would have also been like really, but like it takes a lot for you to uh, like recognize that as well and be like, 
appreciate the apology also yeah. like accept that and all of that yeah. I can imagine it was very tough for you at the time it was because it, legal action is not cheap no, it's very it's nice. very expensive and it takes you away from the business and it it takes so much I'm currently dealing with something quite similar and the way the other people kind of like dealt with it l- literally put me into depression I had to sign mm. myself off from my own business Gosh. how does that make any sense mm. I wasn't able to perform my own job properly I wasn't able to run my own business properly so yeah it's it's really stressful and it's just you know, come on guys, let's just play nice and let's cooperate with each other and this could all be done mm. and over with. It doesn't need to get too far. And what what are the biggest things that you've learned from times like that in business? Like about the way to kind of conduct yourself and like how to deal with the highly stressful time. Like I know with that type of thing, when it's like every single email that comes in, you're like, yeah. you're literally like jumping at it and you're kind of like, it ruins your day every time and like it really sucks the life out 100%. of you. How, what have you kind of learned from those times? I think generally I'm a very resilient person and I'm very like self-aware of my own feelings. I can label my feelings and I can say why I'm behaving in any certain way and what triggered me. And then I'm very vocal and I'm able to be vulnerable with my team and tell them I'm going through X, Y, Z and they're amazing. They'll support me in any way. It's just sometimes it's challenging and sometimes you can handle it and sometimes you can't. For me on this recent occasion, it just got to a point where it was just too much, Mm. just too much. It's not like it's like one design, it's six different designs and it's exhausting, especially where the other people are not respecting you. Mm. And for me, I'm an ethnic minority and I've never ever played the kind of like race card on anything. But on this occasion, I felt, I felt it. I don't know. I just kind of felt like gaslighted and disrespected and made to feel really small Mm -hmm. as if like I cannot be taken seriously based on the claim that I'm making because apparently I'm nothing. And it's just, yeah, it's not nice. Yeah, no, I can completely imagine. I could, I think that with those types of things, it is just so disheartening, especially when you're like, just, I'm not asking for a lot here I'm yeah asking i'm just for like my fair exactly share of this. and i know how hard myself and my team work like it's mm. not just my designs my team yeah from fabric sourcing my team if you come to my studio you will see my team hand embellish um all these like plain styles that happens in my studio when we do you know ahead of a photo shoot is highly stressful time we're last minute changing samples do we want to use a small bead? Do you want to use a bigger bead? Where Where is it going to be placed? All these kind of things. Right. It's a lot of work and it's a lot of time and they're original pieces of work. And then for someone just to be like, oh, right, I'll take that one and I'll take that one and I'll take that one and I'll make money off of your back. And it's mm. just like... And it does mm. harm your business as well. Yeah. Like it's not, obviously it's not what you want to be hearing. And like, as in, but anyone who sees that first, it's yeah. going to harm, like it's going to harm you know, when they see your second and think, oh, okay, you know, it's not, it's not nice. And I can completely, completely appreciate that. I mean, been there, Um, but I feel like it's very, you know, you've dealt with it so well. I remember when I actually saw the one like recently pop up and I know you would like, won't go into detail on it at all, but I loved the way you approached it in terms of being able to be kind of like completely transparent about the fact that that's like, quite a common part of having a fashion business and yeah. like how that affects you as a founder and like even you being able to say like I had to sign myself off work because it was like so tough I you know completely understand I've been through times where I've been like fucking hell like it would just be like that one thing where it just like sucks the living day yeah. like, out of you and you were genuinely like a shell of a human yeah. for like six months at a time and it is like it's world encompassing and it yeah. literally like changes everything for you as a founder will you talk a little bit to the the kind of thing that you put on Instagram when this originally happened and you were talking about all around like IP and how you learned about it and how as a founder you kind of protect yourself I thought that was really interesting when you shared that yeah um one good thing that came out of studying law <laughs> yeah, yeah right <laughs> was I studied intellectual property law as a mm-hmm. module and I actually got first in it um <laughs> yeah Same. so I am knowledgeable around this and I think you know, when people see me on social media as a fashion designer and an owner of a clothing brand, they don't actually know my education or my skills or my knowledge. And they kind of think that they can get away with certain things. But I actually, I'm also very self-educating. I always go online. I read case law. I, I 
everything. I, I do my best to understand how things operate in order for me to protect my own business. And, you know, as you said, when I experienced that recent thing, I did post on my social media about, you know, how you can protect your own designs and what you can do, what is a registered design right, what's an unregistered design right, what are the consequences of you not dis um, registering your designs or all these kind of things. And people found it so useful because I think, you know, when you own a fashion brand, you actually, you are going to be exposed to the potential, you know, theft of your work. Mm. But it's like, if you know how businesses work, then there's a way that you can protect yourself. Right, it's also kind of an occupational hazard in terms of yeah. the way that, like, it's going to happen in some way or another. It might, like, you know, you might have someone come at you and say something when you've never seen them before. Like, as in, like, it's always going to happen, like, one way or another. Educating yourself is, like, so incredibly important. I also think just, like, as a whole, just talking about the fact that actually, like, your education as a founder, like, never truly no. ends. It is very much about, like, constantly learning and, like, I will say firsthand that every time you kind of slow down your learning, the world will tell you how to learn oh, something 100%. very fucking fast. Yeah. And it literally like yeah. comes soaring into your head at the time and like into your inbox, like at the time where you're like, do you know what? It's kind of, it's kind of going fine yeah. now. How do you deal with generally like the roller coaster of being a founder? Oh my God. I feel like, you, you know, in the last 18 months, Canums has grown so much. So is my team. So is our supply chain. So are all the, you know, agencies and everyone that I'm working with. And that it just feels like sometimes, and I, and I know you can relate, where all my limbs are being pulled and I'm like, everyone's needing something from me. And it just gets to a point where I feel like my head is going to explode because I can't stretch myself that far. And where I'm a owner of a small business, I'm still trying to, you know, be cost efficient and trying to manage a lot of things myself because I don't want to start running whilst we're still learning to walk mm. and I really try my best to read a lot of books about how to manage leadership skills mm. having difficult conversations recently when I was on my way to Egypt I read Harvard Business Review's book on emotional intelligence mm. and at work and that really helped me because whilst I'm being a manager and I, I manage a team and everyone's got different personalities. Everyone's got different needs. And I want to understand how do I cater to do those individual needs in order for me to support them and get the best out of them whilst they're working for me. So all of this, I just think it's constant education. You never stop learning whilst you've got a business because you're constantly going to be faced with something you never were faced with previously. And how do you deal with that? It comes from self-education and speaking to people who can kind of advise you on how to handle different situations and scenarios. Yeah, no, 100%. I completely agree. And I think that self-education is so, so, so important. And I feel like as a founder, one of the most stressful sides of things but also you know it's very educational and very exciting but it's one of the most stressful things is that you constantly are learning so many different things at once and feeling like you need to become a master at so many different things whether that is like protecting your design whether that is about like being able to fire someone for the first time and learning how to do that in a way that's both like you know doesn't upset them doesn't make you feel like you're yeah. an absolutely terrible person like all of these kind of different things there's so much to learn at all times you're literally being like a diplomat but you're also yeah. trying to execute but you're also trying to act like a company a size bigger so that you can make the next level of revenue whilst being a size smaller than that like as yeah. in it is a constant battle and I feel like self-education and making sure you're almost setting yourself modules like I always make sure I'm doing that in terms of like you know Harvard Business Review I'd say is a really really good one um things like business of fashion like all of this making sure you're like signed up to the newsletters yeah so like I'll just go through and like bookmark a few and make sure just like once a week I'm like reading something in depth yeah that can improve my ability to um you know to be a leader or to yeah. be a founder or whatever it might be who when you talk about kind of like getting advice in general who do you, do you have like a mentor who do you generally go to you know I've got experience in HR mm. and I'm so lucky because my managers from some of my previous roles we still have contact mm. and you know they've come in on a consultation basis and helped me with several different amazing things see everything led to something oh yeah 100 percent 100 percent um I have even spoken to a business strategist who's helped me kind of like dissect the foundations of my business and, mm. you know, up areas of opportunity. Um, I don't have a mentor, but I try to get mentorship from other areas. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I completely agree. I think that like 
I've never had like a mentor, but I've, in terms of like just being able to have interesting conversations with people, I also feel like just asking a lot of the time, I feel like the most valuable mentorship yeah. or help you can have, usually if it's in a specific area, go to a specific person. But also like the amount of times I've just like messaged people who are, I feel like, just that stage ahead of me in terms of like the business yeah. about specific issues people are so generous and so helpful and I'll always say as well like if anyone messages me like I you know all the time it will be like someone with a fashion business and they're like we're having this current problem with like the way we're structuring like our social media team or like the way we're dealing with this or whatever like I am so happy to yeah. help I'm one of those Aww. people that you know like not even in like a, oh I'm so great but in, in yeah. like it takes so long to work things out mm. and you need to like build the actual rocket Ship while you're in it and oh, like 100%. imagine all of the, like the pieces that need to go in there and you're like what the fuck is this like yeah how do I even build that team and actually like every time you learn something it's such like a triumphant moment that like I have so many founder friends as well that are kind of like by the way you should know this and I'm kind yeah. of like that back as well but it doesn't like it's not easy you have to put yourself in those environments I definitely yeah. didn't like naturally have like founder friends and like naturally know how to be like oh, well, this is how we do this. Yeah. And actually, this is how we tackle this specific problem. You have to like put yourself in that environment. Definitely. Have you managed to like build a kind of network of like people with similar types of roles? I'm so bad at it. I consider myself a bit of an ambivert. Like I don't like going anywhere to network or things like that. I, and I think that comes from imposter syndrome. I don't fully recognize myself still. And I haven't accepted the fact that I am actually a founder of a business and I'm a designer and I should be Put, placing myself in rooms where people like myself and like like-minded people are also there so it's something that I'm working on yeah, you should you absolutely <laughs> should be and it's so it's so funny as well because I also had and still often have like I will unless I absolutely have to I will not go to something that involves networking purely yeah because I'm like at the end of the day the last thing I want is to yeah. talk to more people yeah um yeah. just like realistically but also like I remember I saw networking as like the like the nice part of the job yeah. like the kind of you know the fun thing that people do to say that they're an entrepreneur rather than actually like doing the thing yeah and that was like a real misconception that I had because then when I needed a network to be able to help me when things were going tits up and I really needed like help on like various different mm -hmm. things to be like how did you deal with this how did you deal with this how did you restructure this that was the point that I was like, yeah. shit, I really wish I had people like around yeah. me. And that's when I started like building it up. People from all different backgrounds who had like, who would either work their way up in a more corporate side of like that type of business or like people who generally work in, work in kind of startups, people who've worked in consultancy, like whatever. Literally anyone, I was like, can I pick your yeah, brain on this? Can I pick your really brain good. on this? And I feel like that's one of the best things I ever did because now I like get more confident. I remember this one time where someone had been like, oh, you should jump on a call with this person. They were CEO of like quite a big clothing company. And I remember being like, why, 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 why would I like jump on a call with them? And like, yeah. what would I talk to them about? Like me being like, hi, how are you? <gasps> yeah, good. Like, how are you? Like I was terrified. Yeah. But I'm so glad I did as well because that's just like, it's just networking. Yeah. Like you just learn so much from people and it's fucking terrifying. That's what I need to do. I feel like I'm good at doing it on social media mm. where I'll just follow people and I know, like yourself, mm. your stories are so valuable to me. I, I'm constantly learning that's and I think so. you're very authentic as well. And you know, a lot of the things you say, I'm, I relate to so much. And I think the easy way out for me to kind of connect with entrepreneurs or founders is through social media yeah no absolutely and I feel like that is a very important way of doing it and a very yeah. I mean we do not have a lot of time and like we do not have a lot of like headspace and like bandwidth to be able to like going and finding people in person like yeah. I do think that's very very important I feel like the more I've been more accepting and kind of open to like general conversations with people that are kind of like pop up who are like actually I have experience in this and people are it's so funny that I feel like my audience as a whole like what used to be people kind of all of us being like oh what's the best workout we can do and then it's kind of like very much grown into someone being like oh I actually have you know some expertise in this and this is what I found really helpful and I'll be like thank you so much I really actually really <laughs> fucking needed this now so like anyone who like sends me unsolicited advice I'm like thank you so much yeah. like that really like we all have different jobs and we're all yeah. like adults now like this is amazing but I also think peer-to-peer -peer networking mm -hmm. is really underrated yeah in that we always think networking and mentorship needs to be like upwards mm -hmm. like it needs to be from someone in like a quote-unquote like better or more progressed position to us whereas I feel like the most valuable networking you can get is probably the most valuable is like one step ahead of you yeah, but I would say definitely mutually 
it's going to be the people you're at the same like the same level as and like who are also going through the same things because you go through things in different orders yeah. some of you are going to like build different teams first and it's going to be like you're going to run into different problems first and some of the best advice i've had like i always just message people on social media whether they like it or not i'm like hi so i'm currently having this issue and i was wondering if there's any chance you could tell me how you dealt with it or whatever i love that i'm gonna start doing that please do like if i can ever help on anything yeah. like please do but also i feel like because that's it's so interesting that we don't think about that with social media mm. because that's generally how thing, people do things in the rest of their job so say you yeah. you will message people that you worked in hr with and you're like oh can you help me on this or yeah. whatever and people do that with like past colleagues like we might have someone who's working in logistics here and they'll be like oh, i don't actually know how to head up that project but i have a friend who i know did yeah. that or i have a previous colleague but we don't think about that on social no, media we yeah. but we really should we yeah. should just start messaging each other i and agree just be like, yeah <laughs> <laughs> hello but i think you know you don't ask you don't get your story shows definitely that. definitely um well i feel like that's a really really good place to wrap up i feel like i mean your story is just incredible and one that is both hugely inspiring and also just like i you can so see when you look at the Canem's page now and when you look at your page now on Instagram it's so easy to kind of look at it and be like wow what a nice end goal and like yeah. what how beautiful this looks and how like the Canem's art direction is amazing and like it all looks so incredible and like I can really imagine someone going there seeing that it's like in Harvey Nichols and being like this is a brand it's just a brand it's an established brand it's a brand that makes yeah. things your story behind it and how much you've been through and how like tenacious you've been like I know I've said that word a number of times because it is literally like the most valid word it's, I could possibly use it's one of my favourite words yeah I completely agree <laughs> most valid words I could possibly use to describe you and I feel like you're just such it's so inspiring to hear that story and I hope you are as proud of yourself as everyone is of you like oh, hearing your story and what you've been you. through and how you've get, got to where you are now thank you I am I am I think it's been a journey and it's a roller coaster but I'm fully embracing the fact that it's a roller coaster mm. and you know as you know the whole journey of Canums has been a roller coaster but I've had bigger challenges and obstacles before this throughout my life so for me it just feels like you know we just need to keep the momentum going and keep focused on the end goal yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. And I feel like when you look back at your story as well, if there's one thing that it really shows you is every time there's a roller coaster, there's like a bigger up afterwards. Definitely. And you've made that. Like you've made that happen. But also like every roller coaster now and everything that puts pushes you to the edge of your limits now, that is clearly something yeah. showing you where your next inflection point is. Exactly. And I think I wrote on one of my posts on social media where based on my past life and all the challenges and obstacles that I've gone through and having succeeded and you know, looking at where I am at today, it shows me that nothing is impossible. And every single time I'm faced with a future challenge or a problem, there's no way I'm not going to overcome it. I have so much confidence in myself. And, you know, I am proud of myself based on looking at everything that I have overcome and achieved to date. So it's all onwards and upwards. As you should be. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, and I reckon that everyone will just go and follow you after this because you're amazing <laughs> and I want to see it every day. <laughs> Thank you, you're amazing.